are currently building such machines and they are becoming more and more intelligent. They you even have supporters in your mobile phone like Siri in Apple and so on. Uh, the Apple people are very clever with this. So you have this beautiful voice of a lady who speaks to you from the telephone. And then if you say, I love you, Siri. <laughs> and she says, she answers, oh, I bet you say that to all your Apple products. <laughs> so we can see that. But the reality, leaving joking aside, what we are now witnessing is that artificial intelligence is contributing to a transformation of society that is happening 3,000 times the impact of the Industrial Revolution. Because not only it's happening 10 times faster, but at 300 times the scale. Remember, the Industrial Revolution started in England, and then, then and I went elsewhere, and so on, and so The very slow pace at which this was done, and still, it was a wrenching experience for humanity. The AI revolution, the artificial intelligence revolution, is 3,000 times the magnitude of that. And out of our machines and our software are emerging new types of intelligence. Not a human intelligence, but different kind. Number four is complexity and chaos. We're surrounded by amazing complexity that requires new sciences. And uh, everything that our geometry and mathematics was done for uh, is limited. So it's good for technology, for complex designs, but the classical algebra and geometry can handle the pyramids, but not the clouds. It cannot describe the clouds in, in, in the conventional mathematics and geometry we had. So a new geometry was needed for life and nature. We couldn't describe a flower, much less the pattern of flowering of a tree, or the patterns of leaves that emerge, or the corals of the sea until we got these new fractal geometries as one of the tools that are emerging in the new era that we are living with. Where it brings self-similarity, multiple outcomes, nested hierarchies, incredible applications are emerging from that. We can now model the growth of plants, patterns of flowering, the patterns of cracking and drying earth, the structure of DNA, the path of lightning bolts, this line here, is a fractal. And the snowflakes, formation of snowflakes, the turbulence of gases, which is, are very, very complex, and patterns of coastal erosion, organic constructs, and of course, neural networks. And these are uh, uh, a whole lot of things that are being done right now. And therefore, the new machines are changing our way of dealing with that. And because of that, we have now talked about very big data. We've talked about artificial intelligence. So what I think is going to happen is that we're going to change our attitude towards computer science. So far, to say the truth, most of us consider uh, you know, computer science as just doing the calculations. We as sociologists, economists, geologists, uh, whatever, uh, we're doing the thinking, and then you give the number crunching to the computing. That is going to change. Because partly we are moving from collections of data to connections between collections of data. And who's been doing most on data-based management? Computer science. And uh, where will all this lead to? Well, there'll be new computer architecture, new pathways, clusters, network control, neural nets, multidimensional manifolds, virtual communities, and who knows what else. Number six of my seven pillars is convergence and transformation. That means convergence is simple. We had biology, we had chemistry, and we got biochemistry. In between the existing old traditional fields, new fields are emerging by convergence. And now we are living through bio, info, and nanotechnologies all converging in a new science, which I call BINT. But there's also transformative research, which is capable of changing the paradigm in some fields and domain. So the discovery of DNA transformed biology. It's totally different than it was. Uh, if you look at what biology was late 19th century, first half of the 20th century, and you look at biology today in the journals, in uh, structural genomics, functional genomics, metabolomics, all sorts of, of other gene editing, gene splicing techniques, etc. it's a totally different domain. 
I think the same thing is going to happen to the social sciences in 10 to 15 years because of the big data, which are now mapping transactions between people a lot more effectively than we did in the past. But because of what I said at the beginning about wisdom, we will need pluridisciplinarity, either interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or transdisciplinary, and I won't go into the differences of that, but we need not just the natural sciences, we need the insights of the social sciences and the wisdom of the humanities all together. So these are the seven pillars that I think are transforming the way knowledge is being structured and how it's being changed. But the cultural, minute, cultural mission of the pursuit of knowledge will continue and it will require that we rethink the institutions that serve that mission. Education, from kindergarten to postgraduate, research, whether it's done in universities, public or private labs, and supporting institutions, libraries, archives, don't forget archives, libraries, archives, and museums, all have to change. I mean, you can't have that level of transformation of the world going on, and we're happily doing what we used to do before. So what are the implications for libraries? Well, in the past, when I grew up in Egypt, the problem was the difficulty of availability of information. So we were like people who are very parched to drink and can't find a drop of water. It's not enough. Thirsty for any bit of knowledge we could get, and it's still not enough what we could get. Now, the situation is different. It's too much. You still can't drink. <laughs> I mean, the amount of information on the internet is such that unless you're an expert, I'm, I'm an expert in a number of fields, so I can use the internet to find the specific things I want to find. I know how to differentiate between good and bad. But for somebody who gets confronted with all this information, they may just be following totally uh, unreal things. So what we need is not the water dropper, not the fire hose. We need a glass of water from which to drink. And that, therefore, is our task for our next generation. And in doing so, we have to be careful because we want to make sure that they drink clean water and clear water. And the internet, as I said in the beginning, is anything and everything. And it has the potential to corrupt as well as to enlighten. So to do this in a manner that suits the new generation, the libraries of today and tomorrow will continue to fulfill their role to serve society and mold young minds so that they become more learned people and better citizens. And will be able to live up to the expectations of the school library network program, which I admire a lot and which I noticed Inter Alia had listed this as a task. This is in your text. Uh, there should be spaces of multiple information, resources, and knowledge building. Promote change in education. Promote change, not stability. Promote change in education. Practices supporting learning, curriculum, development, reading, media, information. And creating competent readers, critical thinkers, and active citizens. So that's really needed. Now, the change in education is coming in terms of content, in method, in the participants, and in the venue. But above all, I want to leave that detailed discussion on, on the pedagogy aspects, which we can discuss later on. But I want to talk about the values. What we have is already a huge transformation. Old style storage of information, which looked like that. In parts of my country, it still looks like that. Uh, this is how it looks like in the Library of Alexandria. Our storage facilities, that track will take 100 million books digitized and new forms are emerging. This is the old style retrieval of information, and this is new style retrieval of information. And electronic books, of course, are coming everywhere. I have very mixed feelings about this picture. This is the first picture of the first totally digital library, which was in San Antonio, Texas, that had 425,000 books online and 18,000 journals, and they threw out all the written copies. I can understand why they're doing that, but I must tell you, if you saw that picture I showed at the beginning of what my image of paradise is with all the books, the old books, and the books that have a smell in them when you open them, and the fun that you have when you remember when I read that book 20, 35 years ago, 
I look at this and... <laughs> But it's coming, look, I mean, I, uh, one should be realistic, it's coming. The pictures of the kids I showed you with the texting is coming. So we have an information explosion, but the upside is the librarian's dream. For the first time, as I said, we can really put global knowledge at the fingertips of people. And the digital future is unstoppable. So what do we do with this? Well, for one thing, I don't think it should be just computers because I think people will also be using their handhelds much more than the fixed computer PCs. But we need to think differently about the library space. Everything is changing and libraries must change too. So what will be they be like? That's the conventional view, uh, you know, shh, don't talk, shh. No, no, that, that has to change. So we need to be more welcoming and more exciting. Is this a library? No, actually it's an Apple store. Now, now, wait, 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 this is very important. Apple stores was, was a surprise because everybody was thinking we're moving away from face-to-face -face selling of material, but Apple stores are enormous successes. Why? Because when you go there and there's a blue-shirted guy there, first of all, they look very nice, very inviting, and when you go there, you find people who are very knowledgeable with uh, all identified by blue shirts and they explain to you and they're very patient and they show you and then you decide you want to buy, you don't want to buy, that's different. Well, isn't that what librarians used to do when we went to the library? We used to ask knowledgeable people. So there's a role there that needs to be done, to be done differently. These are the, the Apple people. But now librarians are learning how to go around with their, their uh, pads or their, their iPads or equivalent. We need a space where people can talk, interact, and also be supported by knowledge. Welcoming spaces, exciting spaces, less formal, more user-friendly, and you're already doing that here. And we will find that because we will not need all the spaces which we presently use just for stacking books. We will stack books off-site, and it, there will be availability of digital copies, and if somebody wants to see the original printed book, we can send for it and bring it back, like we used to do with interlibrary loan. So we will have spaces. We need four kinds of spaces in the libraries of tomorrow. A creative, messy space. I serve on the committee, visiting committee of MIT, and we looked at the libraries. Why do young people not use the libraries as much as they used to? Well, it turns out they use the common room in the dorms more. So why? Because of creative, messy spaces like that. <laughs> and it's all right, they will have a space where they can imagine things, draw things, compose, do whatever they want to do. This is our space in the Library of Alexandria, the Alex Poratorium, where the kids do their own things with their own hands as they see fit, where we encourage them to think, well, if you want to ask what if, well, why don't you try? Try an experiment. Don't ask me, do it. See what comes out. Try to explain it to me afterwards. Then you have a little bit bigger, older people, they want to talk more among themselves. There has to be space for group work by students. And then the usual private, quiet research spaces that we are used to providing for somebody doing a PhD thesis, et cetera, and so on. And on top of that, we need community spaces because the libraries must remain at the heart of the community where we can offer exhibitions. This is, these are examples from the Library of Alexandria. Uh, and uh, temporary galleries as well. And above all, whatever you're gonna be doing, be ready to keep changing your plans because they have to be innovative, adaptable, flexible, and active learners because change is happening with incredible speed as I just showed you. But more, and that's my most important point I want to raise with you today, which is values. Librarians defend values. Remember, I said wisdom is knowledge and values, hence it's libraries plus librarians. And librarians must defend their values. And I have two beautiful examples to give you before I conclude, which really explain that the library is at the heart of the promotion of civic values for a contemporary society. No matter how small the library or how modest, this is in Iraq, the values are there, we stand for humanist values, openness to knowledge, pluralism and sharing, caring, critical thinking, all of that will remain. 
and we need to be ready to support social change, but to defend these values. We are the keepers of these values. And here are two great examples. The first came from America with the Patriot Act. Now, after the horrors of 9-11, the Patriot Act came, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and there was a strong demand to support that, uh, what was going on there, and in fact, uh, <laughs> The president had said at the time, you're either with us or you're against us. Uh, there's no in-between in this. So as a result, the Patriot Act has a section which says that according to the section 215, the records of books and other materials you borrow from the library may be obtained by federal agents. And this law prohibits the librarians from informing you if federal agents have obtained records about you. This is in the law. And so the librarians responded. And these four in particular, uh, Noshek, Chase, uh, Christian, and Bailey, said, wait a minute, this is not acceptable. And they said, you can't tell anybody because that's the law. You'll be breaking the law even if you just say that. They said, well, we'll break the law. And they made a case and they supported the opposition. They said, in America, people should be free to read whatever they want to read. They want to read Karl Marx, they want to read Hitler, they want to read whatever they want to read. Nobody tells them what, and we are not going to allow the federal government to get lists of the reading material of people. So all the libraries, big and small, united behind them. And these are cartoons at the time. That's the FBI. Careful, they're not just any librarians. They're Connecticut librarians. <laughs> and they're defending the constitutional right of freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And what was lovely, look at that, the public started putting on their lawns little free libraries where people can come and take books from that. And the, this was the, the, the polling. 80% supported the librarians against 20% uh, opposing them. And it reminded me this action was important because as Edmund Burke had said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So bravo, that was a great example. In the renewal of the Patriot Act, they dropped Article 215. It was not enforced. And uh, luckily, librarians are not normally thought of as being on the front lines of rebellions uh, to defend uh, human rights and civil liberties, but they were, and they did. Now, example two is our own Library of Alexandria. And as you know, we've had revolutions. Since 2011, we've had enormous revolutions in our region of the world. And it was extremely impressive to see. Massive human waves of people. This is the famous Tahrir Square in Cairo, and that's with people in the, with the revolution. And uh, the purpose of it was to change the regime against Mr. Mubarak and his son. Now this is the Library of Alexandria, and that's the, the library, our uh, uh, conference center, our planetarium, and the, two main streets, this way and that way. On this side is the university campus, on this side is the sea, and there are no walls anywhere, so you can just walk across from the street into the library. And the gates or the doors here are all in glass, so it's terrible. Now, people think of Tahrir Square, but here, in fact, is what a, a demonstration in Alexandria looked like. That's on the corniche in front of the library. An enormous uh, amount of humanity. Now imagine me standing there with two or three colleagues watching several hundred thousand people coming chanting down with the regime and so on, and coming towards me and I said, what am I going to do when they come here? And surprise, out of that they came and held hands like that, holding a sign against the regime but said, this is the library, nobody touches the library. And they had no weapons, nothing, just rolled paper, as you can see. And the demonstration was passing here in front of them. And people were extremely orderly. This is prayer time in front of the library, which you can see here. And look how orderly they are. Now, 10 blocks away, this is what they did to government house, which was protected. The same people who protected the library 
they attacked government house, they attacked the police station, they attacked the party headquarters, and they burned them to the ground. Then they made a huge flag and wrapped the library in the flag. And as you can see, there's no walls here, so basically these are just a few steps, but they put this, this flag here so people would respect these stairs and not come into the library. This is on the other side. They did the same thing, and you can see here they're holding hands because, again, there's no walls here and the demonstrations were going through. Not a stone was thrown at the library, despite the size of the demonstrations. Then, our steps became the favorite place for human rights demonstrations. And uh, when the Islamist element began to emerge, the Christians and the liberals started coming to the library. Where else would they go? The library, to say, you know, this is what we want. So here's the crescent and the cross together. There's a cross you can see here in the demonstration standing at the library. This is the army coming here, it's just a, a poor guy by himself looking around. But eight years of hard work have really been summed up by these two pictures and were recognized. But what is more important than that is this. This is a graffiti mural that the young revolutionaries did. They said, we, the youth of the 25th of January, dedicated to those who died in the revolution. And they have the three pyramids the library as the fourth pyramid, and coming out of the library, a church and a mosque together. And I said, the kids understood the message that the library stood for. They knew what they were defending. They were defending the values that we stood for, and they, there's a book that was done by two ladies about hands protecting the, around the library. Uh, this is supposed to be me, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the main thing is how they protected that. And there was even a, a, an exchange with, uh, with uh, CNN about this. And after an 18-month transition, we elected Mr. Morsi as the first uh, president. But that began to see the Arab Spring turn into the Islamist winter. But the people of Egypt rejected the Islamist project and they came out again in people power in their tens of millions into the street, especially the women who were very angry at the proposals in the Muslim Brotherhood proposed constitution. So it was his turn to be removed by people power, but his followers were more willing to use violence, and this is the condition of our streets afterwards. For the first time, the BA was damaged. We had two bullets that came into the glass here. But uh, the minor, uh, we were not targeted. This was just stray bullets that somebody had sent. But we are not being targeted. And above that, so that's the popular support at the base by the young people with and against the regime among the Muslim Brotherhood as well as among the Mubarak supporters as well as those opposed. And the best example I can give of acceptance at the high level this is the inauguration, that's Mr. Chirac and Mrs. Chirac, and this is Mubarak and Mrs. Mubarak, and this is the Queen of Spain, and that's Queen of Jordan. But this is the first Board of Trustees meeting, which in our case, the president is the chairman of the board. So Mr. Uh, Morsi is in the middle there. Then this is 2014, Mr. Adli Mansour is in the middle there. And then Mr. 15, Mr. Sisi is there, and again in 16, Mr. CC is there. So we've established that we are an institution that is accepted by all the political factions that we are above politics, but at the same time that we are supported by the young and the revolutionaries in the street. And we are very proud, very proud that at that time we were honored with the uh, Kalus Gulbenkian uh, uh, Prize. Uh, it really encouraged us to continue on that road and where today we are leading a fight against the Islamist extremists, and I'll say more about that. We remain true to our mission of culture and peace, a culture of pluralism. Uh, we work with the Al-Azhar, Sheikh Al-Azhar, but also with our Pope, the Pope of the Coptic Christians in Egypt. And I tell people, uh, I, they tell me, are you leading this? I said, I'm not leading anything. I like Albert Camus who said, don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Just walk beside me and be my friend. And so I say to all librarians and all those concerned with culture, 
Dare to dream and dare to be bold. It is the dawn of a new age, and let's embrace it. Thank you.